Maps are notoriously hard to refold. It seems like every time you let someone borrow instructions or something, they somehow end up folded differently than how they started. Now, if you're careful and you fold in the same direction as existing creases, you'll usually get it right. But even then, there are ambiguities. When I went to the library to check out a map, some were folded like this, and some were folded like this. If you can't tell which way a crease was originally, though, there are all kinds of ways to refold it. This map, for example, which has nine segments in one direction and three in the other, can be folded up 1,944,000,000 different ways. Naively, you might think there's a cute little equation to get that number. You plug 9 and 3 into your calculator and it spits out 2 billion. This is far from the case. Counting map foldings, sometimes called stamp foldings by the way, is an unsolved problem in mathematics. We don't know the equation for it, and we don't know if there is an equation for it. As of now, the only way to know how many ways there are to fold a map is to count them all, and that takes a very long time. Of course, humans don't count them, computers do, but just to put into perspective how long counting can take, a map with 6x6 squares can be folded 124 billion ways. It took my computer 16 minutes to calculate this. A map with only 7x7 seven seven squares can be folded 130 trillion times, and my computer cannot calculate that. Well, it can, but it would take between 3 and 10 days. The highest that we, meaning all humans, have ever been able to count for is a 7x7. Seven seven. If I wanted to count all the foldings for an 8x8 eight eight map, it would take my computer between 3 and 10 years. This video is going to explain why this problem is so difficult, and how computers do the actual counting. Also, since it seems like such a silly problem to spend time on, we'll look at some applications of the map folding problem. Let's start by debunking some obvious but wrong ways of counting folds. There are two ways of creasing the paper, mountain or valley. So if you add a second fold, it should double the number of foldings, then double it again, and so on. That means the number of ways of folding a piece of paper into n segments would be 2 to the power of n minus 1. If we want to fold the paper into thirds, for example, there would be four ways of doing it. But just looking at it, that's clearly not correct. Adding a second fold actually adds two more options to your first fold, because the next leaf can go over or under the previous one. That's a total of six ways to fold a piece of paper into thirds. So a crease diagram doesn't uniquely describe a way of folding something. There must be more than 2 to the n-1 ways of folding. Crease patterns might not be unique, but leaf order is. If you assign a number to each of your segments, then there's only one way to fold the paper so that the segments are in that order. The number of permutations of n elements is n factorial, so I guess there should be n factorial ways of folding. That would be 362,880 ways of folding our 9 segment map. But wait a second, not every one of those permutations is possible. You have things like this that require the paper to go through itself. Crease patterns don't uniquely describe a folding, and leaf order describes too many foldings, so the real number of ways of folding a map must be somewhere between 2 to the n-1 and n factorial. How do you count the exact number though? Let's start with the 1D case, since the 2D case is an extension of it. I told you there are six ways of folding a three segment paper, but wait a minute, I can't fold a piece of paper into thirds. Could you show the viewers how to trisect a square piece of paper without guessing or using a ruler? Yeah, thanks, I'll let you post that in another video. Now, to count them, you have two options for the first fold, up or down, mountain or valley. After that, you can still go up or down, but for each one, you need to count all of the possible gaps that the last leaf can fit in. If you fold up, then up again, 
then of course you have one gap, because it's the last leaf. And if you fold up, then down, then you have two gaps, one above leaf number one, and one below it. You do the same thing for the case where you made your first fold down. So to count the total foldings for each number of segments, you have to recursively add a leaf in each possible gap until you reach the proper number of leaves. It's not too hard in person, but doing it on a computer is kind of tricky. A human can easily tell when a paper would pass through itself, making a fold invalid, but how does a computer know? You need a clever way of representing folds with numbers. I suppose you could use a list of numbers, each representing a leaf in order, since, like I said earlier, an order of leaves uniquely describes a folding. But it turns out that it's easier to make a list of numbers where the ith number represents the leaf after leaf i. That makes it easy to traverse the folding. You just use each last number as the index for the next. To add a new leaf, you loop through all of the gaps and check which ones don't cross the paper over itself. The paper crosses if any of the leaves above it have a connection with any of the leaves below it on the same side as the new connection that we're adding. You can tell which side the connection is on based on whether the number of the leaf is odd or even. That means we have to loop quite a few times, and our algorithm isn't too efficient. Once you find all the possible gaps, you still have to do the same thing for each of the new ones until you reach the total number of leaves, so it really takes a while. In case you're not familiar with the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, it's a website that keeps track of sequences of integers. Things like the prime numbers, or the Fibonacci numbers, or the digits of pi. It's sometimes the first resource that a researcher will go to to find numbers like this, so it's pretty widely cited. The number of ways to fold a map into n parts is also on there, and there are surprisingly few terms, especially for an n by n map. At one point while making this video, I thought it would be fun to try to calculate and discover the next term myself. It hasn't been updated for a few years, so maybe my 2016 laptop is more powerful than the last computer they ran it on. I tried to write my program using pseudocode from this original map folding paper, but the pseudocode is almost entirely unreadable. I mean, we're talking recursion made out of go-to statements that branch off into other go-to statements, triple nested inline if statements, variables with names like lowercase g and lowercase gg, gap and gapter, and of course lowercase l, you know, like the letter that looks precisely like the number one on almost every monospace font we use for coding, including most typewriters, which they would have been using to write this code before giving to someone to punch onto cards. That's right, this paper was published in 1968. And come to think of it, what language would they have even been using in 1968? This was before C, perhaps Fortran, Algol 68, maybe an abacus or the Ishango bone. I was actually kind of close with Algol 68. This program was written in Atlas Autocode, and it ran on the Manchester Atlas. With a whopping 672 kilobytes of RAM, this was the world's most powerful computer at the time it was made. Although a small fraction of you watching might remember 1968 like it was yesterday, in terms of computers, 1968 was a long time ago. So if I can just get my code working, surely with today's technology, I can discover a new number of map folds. I actually can't get my code working, though. Not using that pseudocode, at least. I went looking to see if anyone had implemented this code in the last 50 years, and I found an implementation in Java that was used to update the OEIS in 2015. Great, now I can compare and see why my code wasn't working. Why is this an L? In the pseudocode, this was definitely a 1. Was the paper wrong this whole time? This paper is big, it's cited by almost everything in the field of map folding math. Okay, maybe that's not saying much. Are you really telling me that they named this variable lowercase l, it got copied down as a 1, and it's been wrong ever since? I'll be totally honest, I don't completely understand this part of the code in the first place, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and maybe they're somehow logically equivalent. If that's the case, please explain it to me in the comments or something. Whether the code is right or not, I think there's a lesson to be learned here. Don't name variables so others can't read them. I get it, maybe you want your code to match your equations. Maybe you just want length, or angular momentum quantum number. Or maybe you already used i, j, and k, and you need another index. But is it really for the best? I don't know, maybe I'm the idiot here and the code makes perfect sense to everyone else. 
The algorithm that I described to count folds in one dimension can be extended to 2D with a few extra checks for foldability. You can also count folds in a 3D piece of paper, although it's a little hard to visualize since you have to fold into the fourth dimension. This extends to any high dimensional paper. At this point, our problem of counting folds and checking foldability might seem pretty specific. Maybe it could be generalized to check if an origami crease pattern is foldable, if you handle the case for different angles, but besides that, what real-world applications does this have? To give you an example, let's look at robot vacuums. The problem for a robot vacuum, or for mowing a lawn, or for puzzles like this that show up in video games, is to visit each spot once and only once, without crossing over your own path, because you don't want to mow a spot of grass twice. The usual technique for commercial vacuum robots is to use either a spiral or a booster feed-on pattern. What, you don't know what booster feed-on means? I didn't either. It means zigzag. If a room has obstacles or a weird shape, the algorithm breaks it down into rectangles and then uses the standard pattern for each one. This usually works well enough, but in many cases there are certain waypoints that you need the robot to visit in order. For example, let's say your robot will mow the lawn while removing a weed, so it first needs to grab a shovel, then it needs to drop the weed off in the clean greens afterwards. A booster feed-on pattern won't be enough for this. We need a little more control over the possible routes. We could of course search through every possible route, but there are just too many. It would be too computationally intensive to check every one. That's where our map folding comes in. A folded piece of paper viewed from the side gives you a route to take. The space of all possible foldings is just general enough to include routes that visit waypoints in different orders, and it's just specific enough that it doesn't take too long to search. Once a robot finds a folding that matches its goal, it can turn that into a sequence of points on a grid and make that its plan. You might even notice that both the spiral and the booster feed-on patterns are included in map foldings. Those are both valid ways of folding a piece of paper. So any algorithms that have been developed for problems like avoiding obstacles or dealing with concave shapes are still going to work with the map folding technique. The paper that introduced the idea of using folds for coverage path planning was published in 2021 and I do not have any insider knowledge on what algorithms are most popular in the cleaning robot industry. If you have a Roomba or something like that, watch its path and let me know if it looks like a folded piece of paper. I hope this video got you thinking about folding things. There are a lot of unexplored problems in map folding math, and if anyone is going to solve them, it's probably the kind of person that would watch this video. That's you. So remember, Maps are hard to fold, robot vacuums aren't that good in booster feed-on. Don't name your variable lowercase l please, it's bad.